Okay, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen uh, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches and practices these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so last time we finished up the part where Jesus talks about us being salt and light. We talked about the image of light. We are to be the light of the world. That means things like we are to uh, work with the Holy Spirit to bring people into spiritual enlightenment to help them become uh, spiritually mature. We're supposed to model the life of Jesus for other people to see. And a large part of that is doing good works so that people can see those good works and that they can glorify Jesus. And in order to do that, of course, we have to be able to explain to them that we are, in fact, doing these works to glorify Jesus. Okay. Now, this morning, we're going to take a look at a very important passage. Again, I always say that. These are all very important. But we're in the middle now of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is going to talk about why and how he fulfills the Old Testament laws and the prophecies and why that is important to us. So let's go back to verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have, come, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So... Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies. I'm sure you know about that. Over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. We usually talk about those at Easter. We usually talk about those at Christmas. So I'm going to kind of let that pass because we talk about that a lot. One of the things we don't talk a lot about, though, is how he fulfilled the Old Testament law. Now, the Old Testament law is really the requirements for earning your way to heaven. If you don't want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there is a way to get to heaven. That is, you've got to follow the Old Testament laws. There's 316 just in the Pentateuch alone, which is the first five books of the Bible. And you have to follow them perfectly. Of course, no one's able to do that except Jesus. So not only did Jesus follow all of the Old Testament laws perfectly and earn eternal life, he also earned the right to give eternal life to those people who accept him as their Lord and Savior. So let's take a look. Let me, um, again, let me just make the point. You've got to follow these laws perfectly, okay? Jesus in Matthew 5, 48 is going to say, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, all right? So you sin one time, you're done. You sin one time, you're done, okay? So the whole point of the Old Testament law is, number one, to show us what God expects from us, okay? Perfection and also to point to the need for a savior because there's no way that we can follow these laws perfectly. Let me give you some examples. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, very famous uh, passage in Judaism. It's called the Shemaiah. Listen to what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Nobody can do that for five minutes, let alone a lifetime. And if you think you can do this for five minutes, you have a very superficial understanding of what it really means. So let's try to understand what it really means, okay? Nothing can come between you and your love for the Lord. Nothing. No desire, no want, no need, no family, not your own life, not your children's lives, absolutely nothing can come between you and your love for the Lord. Okay? Nothing. Not only that, that's exactly what the first commandment of the Ten Commandments says. You shall no, have no other gods before me. Many people read that and they misunderstand the word before. Before has some meanings, a couple meanings. One of them is a numerical meaning. This came before that, right? That's not what the word means, like you got God number one, and closely behind God is your wife, your family, your money, your power, your life, all those. No, no, no. Before also has the meaning of in the presence of. If you go before Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to say, why have you come before me? What does he mean? Why have you come in my presence? 
Okay, that's what it means in that commandment. You shall have no other gods in my presence. How far does God's presence extend? Throughout all creation. So that commandment, and the Shemaiah means you could have no other gods, period. Nothing, absolutely nothing can come between your love and your devotion for the Lord. Think about that. All your strength, all your life, always pleasing the Lord, you ready? In every thought, word, and deed. Okay? That's the requirement. Now, you know, that's exactly what Jesus did. In John chapter 8, it says, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. And then in the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, while he was still speaking, this is Jesus, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Listen to him. Okay? Now that's just one commandment. Okay? Now, generally speaking, those 613 laws I talked about in the, old, in the Pentateuch are divided into three sections. Usually we talk about ceremonial law, we talk about civil law, and we talk about moral law. So let's just take a quick, a quick perusal through some of these laws so you can get an understanding of what Jesus has done for us. So let's talk about the ceremonial laws, of course, governed the worship of Israel how Israel was supposed to worship, okay? Now, the sacrificial laws, which we talk about quite often, uh, how you're going to sacrifice animals in the temple, all those kinds of things, that's part of the ceremonial laws, okay? So let's just take a look at this. Again, what is the point for the, um, the, the, uh, the, the sacrificial laws? They were a temporary atonement for sin, right? Not permanent, temporary. That's why they had to be done over and over again. But they also were an object lesson pointing everybody towards their need for a Messiah. Okay? So, these have to be followed perfectly. Let me give you an example. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to what this says. This is about a burnt offering, which is an offering that you would give for a sin. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you ought to offer a male without defect. Is any animal perfect? Is any animal absolutely perfect? And not only that, if you take this seriously, think about it. You have to sacrifice an animal every time you sin. Thought, word, and deed. If you take that seriously, what's going to happen? You're going to spend your whole life sacrificing animals. There aren't enough animals on planet Earth to cover all of our sins. When you throw in all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our deeds, and I don't want to take anything away from next week, but you get angry with somebody, that's a sin. Or you get angry with somebody, yeah, there goes another animal. You say something you shouldn't say, there goes another animal. You look at a woman lustful, well, there's another animal. You know, that's exactly what happened to Martin Luther. Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk who took that seriously. He would go to confession for four, five, six hours a day, every single day in the monastery until... His confessors would say, Martin, look, you've got to stop. You're obsessing about this. And he's like, what, what do you mean I've got to stop? I've got to, I've got to confess and repent for every single... If I forget a sin, then I won't go to heaven and blah, blah, blah. Until finally he reads Galatians 3.11, which says what? The righteous will live by faith. We're not saved based on how many sins we confess. We're not excluded from heaven if we forget to confess one sin. That's not the point. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? The entire sacrificial system pointed towards a Savior. Listen to this in Hebrews chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. They are not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would, have, would they have not stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed from all their sins once for all and no longer have felt the guilt of their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sin, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And of course, he goes on to explain how Jesus Christ was sacrificed once for all. Okay, let's talk about the civil laws. Civil laws in ancient Israel, in the Old Testament, really are, are talking about guides for daily living. Guides for daily living. So they take in things like the holiness laws, kosher laws, that's part of the civil law. Penalties for uh, 
uh, civil penalties, you know, when you do something you shouldn't do to somebody. What's the penalty for that? It also talks about the form of government that Israel was supposed to have, a theocracy where, where God is their king, okay? Now let's just focus in on the holiness code, okay? A lot of misunderstanding about the holiness code, okay? It was to make the people of God holy. Not just in the sense of morally pure, but holy means separate. When Israel goes into the promised land, they are to be different from the Canaanites. How they dressed, what they ate, how they ate, how they planted their crops. All of these things are included in the holiness code. Leviticus 7, chapter 17 through 26 is where the holiness code is found. Let me just read some quick excerpts. Uh, chapter 17, verse 12. Therefore I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor, nor any foreigner residing among you may eat blood. Leviticus 19.19, 19, do not plant your field with two kinds of seeds. Do not wear clothing woven together uh, with two kinds of materials. Okay? Now how does Jesus fulfill this? Well, when Jesus comes, our holiness, our difference from all of the people in our world that haven't accepted Jesus is not based upon the clothes we wear, how we plant our fields, or, or, what, or, or, uh, or, or anything of that nature, what kind of foods we eat and how we eat. That's not, what is our difference? What we believe in and how we behave. As uh, Paul says in Romans, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The third section of laws are the moral laws, and people get confused on this all the time, especially Christians. Here's what they get confused on. What moral laws in the Old Testament are still binding on Christians today? Well, it's a very simple answer. Those laws that the New Testament confirms, okay? Those are the ones that are binding upon us. And if you study the New Testament, you'll find all of the Ten Commandments are confirmed in the New Testament, okay? But this is where we get into a modern-day controversy, homosexuality, okay? You're probably familiar with the Old Testament, the holiness laws I just quoted to you. In Leviticus 18.22, it says, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. So liberals today go, yeah, but that's right after you talk about not wearing clothes with the same kind of thre different threads and not planting your fields with two different kinds of seeds. So why do you accept one and you don't accept the other? It's very simple. The New Testament confirms what the Old Testament says about that particular issue. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, it says, We also know that the law is not made for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for homosexual, I mean for sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine that confirms that the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. So all of those things, which are mentioned in the Old Testament, now are confirmed in the New Testament, okay? By the way, nowhere in the New Testament do we find any kind of prohibition against planting your field with two different crops or wearing clothing that has two different kinds of material. Those things fall away because Jesus Christ has fulfilled them, okay? As a, as a matter of fact, as we continue next week in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to expand the moral law, okay? But I don't want to take away anything from next week. So let's finish up. Verse 18, I'll tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished or everything is fulfilled, okay? No changes to the Old Testament law until what? Until everything is fulfilled, until everything is accomplished. When does that happen? When Jesus Christ dies on the cross. Jesus says in John chapter 19, after he received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In Ephesians, Paul says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, which he lavished upon us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when times will have reached their fulfillment, his death on the cross, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So once Christ dies on the cross, what happens? The New Testament perspective on all of the Old Testament laws kicks in. And the laws that are not repeated in the New Testament fall away from what we're supposed to follow as Christians. 
and you can read Galatians, and in the New Testament they have a lot of debate about this, okay? But only the laws that they talk about in the New Testament that are confirmed are the laws that we need to follow, okay? Look at verse 19. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is, I think, a difficult passage, so let's just take our time. What's going on here, this is a direct criticism of the religious leadership of Jesus' day, specifically the Pharisees who are referred to in the next verse. So let me explain. According to Jewish religious tradition, not the Bible, tradition, in the Old Testament days, the days of Jesus, for example, and even today, for that matter, okay, the ruling Jewish council called the Sanhedrin in Jesus' day could exempt, they could exempt, they could change, they could revise, they could declare invalid any commandment in the Old Testament, except for idolatry, if they thought it served a larger purpose. Now think about that. If the ruling council, based on social conditions, economic conditions, whatever the case may be, right? Maybe there was a famine, and they could, they could say, you know what? Forget about the Sabbath laws. Go work on the Sabbath, because if we don't work on the Sabbath, we might all die. Go ahead. You can break them. They had the power to do that. They had the power to do that. Maimonides, who was probably the most famous Jewish philosopher, lived in the Middle Ages around the 12th century, he says this, the Sanhedrin had power when it was convenient for the present time to make void any affirmative commandment or to transgress a negative one in order to return many to their religion or to deliver many of the Israelites from stumbling at other things. They may do so whatsoever the present time necessitates. So as one of their wise men had said, a man may profane one Sabbath in order to keep many Sabbaths. All right? Now, when you, when, you, when you think about what's going on here, and this is what Jesus is arguing against, where does the authority reside? It doesn't reside in the Old Testament because the religious leaders of Jesus' day can change it. They can exempt everybody from it. So where's the real power and authority? It's in the religious leadership of Jesus' day, okay? That's what he's talking about. Second of all, it creates a hierarchy of sin. For example, idolatry, murder, and, 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 uh, and, and things of that nature are, are more important than gossip and stealing and coveting and observing the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, you find this today in the Roman Catholic Church with their division of, of uh, mortal sin versus venial sin. Mortal sin you can lose your salvation over. Venial sin is not that important, okay? That's where you get the whole idea of, um, of sacred tradition in the Catholic Church on equal footing with Scripture. That's where you get the Pope's infallibility. Ideas like that come from that mindset. That's why we had the Reformation. That's why we had the Reformation, okay? Sola Scriptura, all right? All right? The sole authority for the Christian is the Scriptures, okay? Not what any person in a leadership position might say. So the idea Jesus is arguing against here is there is not a hierarchy of Scripture. Let me just take a moment to give you a passage that the Roman Catholic Church looks to to support that idea. It's 1 John chapter 5, 16 and 17. I'll go through it quickly. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is, but there is a sin that leads to death. Okay. Now, if you read the whole Old Testament, you should know exactly what John is talking about. He's talking about the unforgivable sin that Jesus talks about, which is denying the work of God the Holy Spirit, which is denying Jesus as your Lord and Savior, which is rejecting Jesus. Yeah, you reject Jesus, you're not going to heaven. That's a sin that leads to death, but there's no hierarchy in the New Testament that says one sin is worse than another. As a matter of fact, we're going to do it at great length next week because Jesus follows this discussion with examples of what he's talking about. So let me finish at verse 20. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you have to realize to the general public in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were very righteous. I mean, we know what's going on in their hearts from the New Testament. Jesus certainly knew what was going on in their hearts. 
but for their public life, they observed all of the uh, uh, sacred holy rituals perfectly, at least in their eyes. So when Jesus says, hey, unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees, you're not going to go to heaven, that would have been very scary for the regular average everyday person because they thought that the Pharisees were, in fact, quite righteous. But go back to verse 19. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches them, teaches others to do the same will be called what? Least in the kingdom of heaven. See, what Jesus is saying is, even if you don't follow everything that he wants you to do perfectly, if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you're still in the kingdom. He's giving us an example here, right? He just said, don't think about a hierarchy of sin. That's not biblical. Don't teach that to other people, a hierarchy of sin. That's not what I want. But then he goes on to say, but I know how people are. You're not saved because you live a perfect life. You're saved because you have faith and trust in me. And that's the point here, okay? How does our righteousness surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees? Well, it's simple. We get it from Jesus Christ on the cross, right? Remember the double transfer? I give Jesus the consequences of my sins and God punishes him in my place. Jesus gives me the consequences of his righteousness and when God sees me, he doesn't see my sins. They've been forgiven. And he sees me wrapped in the righteousness of Christ so I can have a relationship with him right now. So that's what Jesus is trying to explain here. And I hope that that's clear to everybody. Amen? Let's pray.